everybody on Offsite Dirt. This is Karen Benner with the Building Better with Karen show. I'm so excited to be here today with Sarah Gutterman of Green Builder Media. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Karen. <laughs> thank you for taking. You. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time. Um, just as a quick background for everybody, um, I have known of Sarah and Green Building Media for um, Green Builder Media for uh, several years. Um, they've always been engaged with a lot of the um, builders that I've been engaged with and always bringing out great content, great tours, uh, great um, uh, content at the builder show that they've added to. And uh, and then I also had the opportunity to go through Sam Rashkin's Housing 2.0 workshop through this organization last year, which was amazing as, as one can imagine. And then uh, most recently, I've been thrilled to be a part of an amazing group of people that came together under the Green Builder Media um, their initiative around creating an ESG working group for our industry. And uh, so I'm going to just take a quick second to let Sarah give an overview to all of you about um, her, her organization, touch on any of those topics that she'd like to and uh, prep us for what we're going to talk about today. Wonderful. Thanks, Karen. Um, so Green Builder Media is North America's leading media company focused on green building and sustainable living. Uh, we've been around for nearly two decades now. I can't believe it. I co-founded the company uh, in 2005 with a gentleman named Ron Jones, who is known as one of uh, the early pioneers in the green building movement. I actually came out of venture capital, um, but was really focused on growing companies that were sustainable, that were simultaneously sustainable and profitable. Um, we really set a our flag in the ground very early on uh, to be on the leading edge of innovation. And so everything that we do has really uh, endeavored to uh, fulfill the mission of enhancing the sustainability of the built environment. So all that we do, our, our media and communications channels, our vision house demonstration projects, our events, our cognition, smart data, market intelligence, and data services division, it's all focused on uh, topics like decarbonization and electrification of the built environment and transportation and circularity and net zero everything and healthy home, connected living, resilient housing, uh, those types of topics that are, are near and dear to us and so important uh, in terms of uh, evolving our built environment, our homes and buildings um, into a next generation version that not only is um, more biophilic, uh, more regenerative and better for the planet, but also better for occupants. Awesome. I think you've touched on every single hashtag that we could possibly use to um, entice our audience for why they might want to listen to this episode. Really, really <laughs> great content coming out of um, all of that. So the Cognition Smart Data, uh, that's definitely um, a feature, a, a service that you all provide that I want to be sure to hear about today. I don't know much about it. I'm uh, eager to learn and would love for you to share more about that with everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for asking about that, because it's kind of been my brainchild for the past almost decade. Um, so Cognition Smart Data, as I mentioned, is our market intelligence and data services division. Um, we port in a variety of different data sets, uh, starting, of course, really deep vertical data on our audience, which is comprised of hundreds of thousands of the most progressive building professionals across the US and a bit up, to can up into Canada, and millions of early adopter and first mover consumers, the majority of whom now are millennials and older Gen Zs, who, as you well know, have seized that top influencer position in the housing market, spending more money on buying and remodeling homes than any other audience segment. And uh, so they're really impacting the housing market. And um, fortunately, uh, this audience segment, these younger generations, have an inherent ethic of sustainability. It's kind of in their DNA. And when we look at how those younger generations respond to our surveys, how they engage with us, what they read, what they like, what they don't like. It's very clear that sustainability is a major consideration factor when purchasing homes and products for homes. Um, and, and they have a bit of a different um, perspective on 
uh, how they live in homes and then how they buy homes, right? It's not just about lowest upfront cost or lowest price per square foot. It's really about long-term value of home ownership. And Karen, you've been in this industry and doing this work long enough to know that we've all been trying to change yeah. that metric for decades. Yes. Uh, and I think it's finally happening. That transformation is finally happening. Um, we also port into Cognition. Um, we have a proprietary technology platform that uses um, Watson's, uh, IBM Watson logic. And so it mines for trends using contextual filters and parameters that we give to it. Uh, so looking at those topic areas that I mentioned earlier, like decarbonization and electrification and healthy, connected, resilient, solar plus storage powered homes and buildings. Um, and then we also port in market growth data. So as you can imagine, when we um, collate <laughs> this data together, uh, and look at trends, we have a lot of predict predictive analysis capability, uh, given that all of our data is really either from early adopter and first mover audience segments or leading edge trends. Um, and then we're able to analyze and interpret that data um, and work with our partners, colleagues, clients, whether those are builders, architects, <clears throat> developers, other types of building professionals or manufacturers. Um, and as you can imagine, again, we really <clears throat> have some incredible insights uh, targeted on those topic areas that are near and dear to us. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And um, and you're right. I mean, music to my ears to hear that we are looking at data other than upfront costs and cost per square foot. That's excellent. Uh, would love to um, continue to move away from that being our um, our measuring tool. And um, so who are the types of um, clients that come to you and ask you to, um, to use this service to help them better their product or their marketing message or their quality control or their customer service, whatever it is? Uh, can you, are you willing to share some examples of how this has uh, benefited some of the um, products or services or providers that we're all familiar with? Absolutely. So, um, and I, I won't give specific names, but uh, we work regularly with manufacturers to help them do everything from uh, launch new products to product development. Um, we also work with them to use this data to inform marketing, campaign development, positioning, audience segmentation. Uh, we've even worked with uh, C-level folks at large manufacturing companies to help them understand M&A activity, what sectors they should be looking at or you know, what particular companies they're looking at. We also really love the opportunity when we get to work with builders uh, and developers um, yeah. because when we work with them, we get to share consumer insights, uh, what consumers are looking for, what they at least say that they will pay more for, uh, <laughs> things that they say they will invest in. Um, because what invariably happens when we work with builders and developers is that they rely on this data to make decisions about how to enhance the sustainability of their projects. Um, and sometimes it's an either or scenario, right, where um, if they're going to spend money, they want to spend it on the highest impact elements that are most important to their uh, target audiences in their target geographic markets, um, but in other cases, we've really been able to make it an and proposition so that we can say, all right, if you're going to enhance the energy efficiency and incorporate renewable energy for your projects, you can qualify for 45L um, you know, tax uh, incentives. And then the, your homeowner, especially with uh, Inflation Redu Reduction Act funding, um, you know, we kind of help navigate and say, all right, if you're going to enhance the performance of insulation or windows and doors, make sure your homeowner knows that they can, they may be paying a little more, but they can uh, apply for these tax rebates um, through the Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, that's how we've been able to make it an and proposition. Uh, we've also been able to work with some developers to do things like create um, fire protection systems for communities, uh, you know, entire homes, which as you can imagine is of paramount importance really anywhere in the Western half of the country, but sure. particularly is like California, where I live here in Colorado, in the mountains of Colorado, um, because we're able to, again, work with them to um, 
by offering fire protection systems, they're able to reduce uh, the size of their streets because they don't have to have uh, the, the same amount of space for fire trucks and the same number of hydrants. The rules change a little bit. So there's a little bit of savings here, even though there's a little bit of a greater extent, uh, uh, expenditures over there, but it becomes a kind of a net, a net positive in terms of the value proposition and net neutral in terms of the cost. Yeah. And I love that last example, too, because it ties into something that um, people hear me talk about a lot on this show, which is uh, pre-planning the integrated design process, really getting a team together very early on to address goals and um, challenges and, and how to tackle all of that. And and so that example you just shared about a, a builder or a developer knowing very early on in their site planning phase that they might need, you know, there might be fewer requirements around a fire truck access or fire hydrants because of decisions they're going to make in construction methods, uh, you know, far, far, much farther along in the construction sequence process if they made that decision later in the construction sequence process and hadn't known that it was going to give them a benefit early on, that's, that's a lost opportunity. So, um, so I love that example as well, just to highlight the bringing everybody together early and um, being able to look at these innovations and um, maximize their value. Just like you said, that's amazing. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, and I think that um, it, this is a really nice dovetail into another topic, which I know we wanted to cover today, which is uh, our Transcend Communities Initiative. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, which um, is definitely going to pique the interest of anyone listening from Offsite Dirt, not only because of the high performance, but these are homes that are being built in a factory. So, yeah, let's dive into it. Yes. So, um, Green Builder Media is partnering with a prefab home builder called Devel, uh, California-based home builder, although um, we are expanding uh, across the country uh, so that we can service, we've gotten a lot of demand <laughs> in the eastern half of the country. And Great. Um, so we're expanding uh, manufacturing capability. So now we can um, service the eastern half of the country as well. Um, we are building homes and communities. I'll start with the homes. Uh, the homes themselves, uh, Devel homes in general are uh, prefab, so absolutely manufactured in a facility and designed to be net zero, all electric, healthy, connected, resilient, solar plus storage powered, and beautiful. Uh, they've got a very modern and sleek design. And uh, we actually have, have done um, a variety of different prefab projects and partnered with different prefab partners. And um, before we started, uh, before we kicked off this Transcend transcend communities initiative, we did due diligence actually for a couple of years and interviewed probably every single <laughs> prefab manufacturer <laughs> out there. And we decided that we thought that Devel um, was a great choice just because their baseline product is so high performance and good and beautiful. Um, but by coming together with us, what we're able to do now is elevate the story beyond uh, the home itself, which is an amazing story, but now we're looking at these communities, which are, Karen, as you said, and the reason why I brought it up in the context of, uh, you know, the, the pre-planning for community design, uh, what our intention is with these Transcend Communities is to really think about how we can create next generation communities uh, by incorporating a lot of these decisions into the pre-planning, whether it's fire protection systems, whether it's microgrid uh, renewable energy systems with community scale solar arrays and battery storage systems um, that optimize the energy harvesting and usage and monitoring and sharing between these homes even before that energy hits the grid. Yeah. Uh, looking yeah. at geothermal um, and community scale geothermal and how uh, that can really turn out to be a cost beneficial uh, thing, especially again with some of the IRA funding. And then I know in certain states, again, like where I'm here in Colorado, uh, there's a geothermal grant that's going to be launched to help um, try to stimulate the implementation of geothermal, um, which I think to date hasn't had um, quite as much activity around the creative financing that solar has had. 
And that's perhaps one of the reasons why it's lagged behind a little bit. But especially with a lot of the heat pump products uh, that are out in the market now, um, you know, ground source and air source, um, uh, you know, I think that that ground source geothermal um, is actually going to uh, increase in terms of demand. Um, I know, for example, we have a Transcend demonstration home, not a full community, but a home coming here to where I am at 9,000 feet in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, It was actually supposed to be delivered a couple of weeks ago, but the California Department of Transportation held up our transportation permits because the recent storms washed out the roads and bridges that we oh, were going to on our gosh. route. So they had to reroute us. They had to fix some bridges, uh, but we finally got the permit. So we should be seeing that home here any soon now, uh, any minute now. But um, but my point is that we, for that particular demonstration home, we're really excited because we're working with Upinor, which is a company that does PEX piping and radiant in-floor heat, to bring one of their systems. It's a radiant uh, heating and cooling panel that actually goes into the ceiling, super efficient, very prevalent in Europe, but they're bringing it here to the U.S. for the first time for wow. this demonstration project. And it's a water to water system. It does uh, air heating and cooling, but also the water uh, heating uh, for the home as well. And so we're using a geothermal a ground source geothermal system which is probably overkill in the context of a 1500 square foot demonstration house. But um, because it's a demo project, we really want to showcase, you know, the most advanced products and systems and technologies. And so sure. coming back full circle to transcend communities, I think that if we do exactly what you mentioned, which is really think uh, from the very beginning about, let's just call them leapfrog technologies, right? So rather than using traditional energy infrastructure or even water infrastructure, how can we utilize, uh, you know, solar plus storage and geothermal and other uh, next generation energy solutions? How can we look at uh, different types of water solutions, right? Maybe there are now hydro panels that actually harvest water Uh, They look like solar panels, but they actually harvest potable water out of the air. So we're looking at how we can use some of these technologies on a community scale for transcend communities in areas that might be prohibitive to bring in municipal water infrastructure. Uh, Same thing, you know, with sewage systems and septic. And um, but I think now is a really exciting time on a community scale to look at these leapfrog products and systems and technologies and see how we might be able to implement them. Because again, if done right, they can at least be cost neutral, if not cost positive. Yeah. Wow. That um, I have not heard of that at all. This is brand new to me today, that um, technology being available. So to make sure I understood, is that being incorporated in this demonstration home or that's still a future goal? The um, the using, the yes. Yeah. Uh, So we're actually not going to be showcasing them uh, initially on the demonstration project, Um, but it may be something that we end up installing a little bit later on just to test um, because I'm really excited about them and and really test them as well. And so this demonstration home, once you finally, now that you have your permits and it's on route and it'll be set um, imminently, uh, it will presumably be open to to tour and um, how and when can folks plan to reach out to you and make that happen? Absolutely. So um, there will be some steps, as you know, it's not like, I think people have this perception of prefab homes that they come and they're completely finished and you pop them down on the site and then you're ready to to get your certificate of occupancy. You know that that is not necessarily, (laughs) there will still be after we do the set and stitch, um, there will still be some work. We'll have to drill the, the geothermal. The solar is actually being installed today as we speak. Um, wow. But, uh, um, you know, I assume we're in a pretty remote location. And so, honestly, our biggest challenge right now are, is getting um, electricians and plumbers yeah. and folks to, to kind of do the hookups. Um, I would say, though, hopefully by November of this year, it will be available to tour. Um, folks can just um, shoot me an email. It's Sarah, S-A-R-A dot Gutterman at greenbuildermedia.com. Uh, if they're interested in touring, uh, we are, uh, in Southwestern Colorado, 
about 30 miles uh, due east of Telluride. Um, so we're a little bit of a trek, um, but okay. we're definitely be doing live streams and lots of virtual work um, and videos from the, the project itself. But if anyone wants to come to um, what I think is still the most untouched and beautiful area of Colorado, and I grew up here, so I know Colorado pretty well, uh, <laughs> and that's where we are. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and, uh, I want to come. <laughs> for sure. That's what, the, that's what the home is really here for. It's for people to come and experience uh, what a prefab, net zero, electric, healthy, resilient, uh, solar plus storage connected home looks and feels like. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you brought up that you're kind of challenged with the labor force, because I was thinking about that even back to some of these amazing technologies that you're talking about. And I was curious as to how much of that is accomplished in the factory setting, which is still also uh, pot a potential learning curve for people in the factory and on the production line to to understand their role. But then um, even more challenging, as you mentioned, in a remote location to find the local tradespeople that are then, you know, doing the final connections. And do you have any any wisdom or stories or insight into how you've overcome that? Or are, is it still just as much of a struggle for you as it seems to be for a lot of us in the country? <laughs> I, I am going to answer your question completely honestly, Karen. I don't know how anyone is getting anything done in the building industry right now. <laughs> I don't. And granted, you know, our scenario is exacerbated because we are as rural, rural, rural as it gets, right? We are in Hinsdale County, Colorado, which is 96% public lands. It is one of the least populated counties in the lower 48. We are here on purpose just because it is raw, majestic, wild nature. Way more elk and deer and bear and moose and mountain lion and coyotes and foxes and eagles than people. Um, in fact, I think we have 800 people in our entire county. Wow. Um, and, you know, billions of trees, <laughs> you know, I think uh, eight 14 ers in our county, you know, so we're, we're here on purpose. But wow. Uh, and, and again, I think that that has really exacerbated the labor challenge. I mean, we on another project, we're building a, another project here called Mariposa Meadows. It's a 123 acre in holding. So it's a piece of private property surrounded literally by millions of acres of national forest. That's going to be another uh, demonstration project uh, that's intended to have people come and stay there. It's off grid, net zero, everything. Beautiful, beautiful um, project as well. Um, but it's taken us two years just to finalize the solar system because of labor challenges. Yeah. Um, so, and I, when I, when I talk with my friends and my colleagues who are building in urban markets, you know, I think some of them, um, like, you know, the production builders and even the volume builders, they've got their production style uh, process down. And so I think that they have their contractors in place. And while they may struggle here and there with labor and some material shortages still, um, I think they're a little less impacted. But for the most part, <clears throat> you know, I think that smaller scale builders, um, I think people are very impacted uh, by this labor issue. It's very pervasive. Um, what I've found is that somehow contractors have gotten to a point where it's okay just to not even respond, right? To say, and this is not just our experience, it's certainly ours, but it, it goes yeah. far beyond this, um, where, you know, a contractor will say, all right, you know, I'll give you a bid or I'll call you back or I'll be there in a week. And then crickets, nothing yeah. ever. Been. And that makes me sad, not just for our projects because it's frustrating, <laughs> But it makes me sad that the industry has devolved so that so that people think that that's OK, because I think what's happened is that it has it has eroded the level of respect that we end up having at, uh, for each other as building professionals. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, and I think that that's a downward spiral that will continue to negatively impact the building industry. I don't think that that becomes a virtuous cycle that bolsters communication and effectiveness and productivity. 
Yeah. Well, uh, gosh, this could be a whole other episode, I feel like, to talk to you about what Green Builder Media is doing or might consider doing in the future to tackle the workforce issue, uh, because we all know it, what it is. I mean, it's, it's definitely one of the topics that I love to talk about on this show, because we need innovative solutions to the labor issue, just like we need innovative products and materials. And um I think, you know, in the interest of time today, I think it's worth just pointing out that uh, if we can move more of the process into a, a factory setting where there is more opportunity to be training and developing people to uh, repeat, <laughs> uh, even when it is innovative, you know, to, to do that and then limit the percentage of the construction that needs to happen on the site it's certainly never going to be completely eliminated, but it, the less work that you would need to ask somebody to come out and do in your remote location, uh, that's only going to make it easier for, for them to be able to accommodate you. So that's, um, you know, we'll just take this opportunity to make another plug for um, one of the many benefits of offsite construction to help solve that problem. And, um, and yeah, so getting back to the the communities again, I want to just ask, um, where are you with um, with developments with partners? You mentioned that you're looking for people, you know, out here uh, in the eastern part of the the country where I am, and we I'm in Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania has more, at least I believe, still more uh, manufactured and modular plants than any other state right now. I'm curious. Um, are you still looking for more partners? Are, are you looking for developers? Are you looking for land? What can we do to help you um, connect with people from our interview today to maximize the value of what you're trying to accomplish? Oh, thank you. What a wonderful question. <laughs> uh, so the answer is yes, all of the above. Um, okay. We are absolutely looking for partners, for developers, for land. Um, I think Ideally, um, our we're looking for developers who have land and kind of are far enough down the process where they have some entitlements and some idea of what they want to do, um, but you know are clear that they want to do pre prefab offsite some kind of a next generation community, right? Because uh, with these communities, we do want to make sure we're writing we're working with this the right type of person that has you know, the same kind of ethic um, sure. with respect to wanting to do microgrids and potentially, you know, geothermal and, you know, some of these other technologies. Now, we understand that not every technology is going to be completely applicable for every project, and each project is going to be a little different based on where it is. Um, but, you know, we also want to do things like utilizing natural features of the property um, to enhance uh, resiliency. I think Babcock Ranch in Florida is a great example. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but oh, yeah. in Central Florida, so you know, it's one of the only communities, perhaps the only one, that actually didn't flood after Hurricane Ida because it used the natural swales and the mangroves to do what nature's supposed to do, which is absorb floodwater, right? Yeah. And so it was, it was potentially one of the only or the only communities that didn't flood in that in that terrible um, natural catastrophe. And so those are the types of, again, pre-planning decisions that we'd like to make with our partners uh, in these transcend communities. So, uh, Karen, if you have if you know developers, if you know partners um, that, you know, would, that have the, a shared vision, um, then yeah. we would be very interested in exploring uh, conversations around how we might be able to pull our various uh, resources together to create these transcend communities. Great. And on the production side, are you working with anyone right now other than Devel? You know, at this point, transcend communities is a partnership uh, with Devel. Okay. Um, I think though that um, there are some things that we understand that, you know, some types of projects that uh, that even the develop team understands that their, their types of homes that they produce are not necessarily applicable for. And so I think that we are open to having other types of conversations with other prefab manufacturers. 
Okay. Um, I will say, um, just full disclosure, I am on the board of directors for DeVille. Sure. Um, and so, you know, and that's partly because we do want to make this a, a very close partnership. But um, we are in the process of having some conversations with some developers where, uh, as a part of a development, there are some DeVille homes, and then there will be some homes that will be manufactured by uh, other partners. Um, so that's certainly a scenario that we'd be happy to entertain. Great. Great. Well, I'm so glad that we got a chance to hear about both of these exciting topics today and everything that you all have going on. I know, um, again, you all just, you cover so much ground, you've been doing it for so long, and um, you bring such a level of commitment and professionalism to everything you do. I've always enjoyed uh, being connected and, and um, reaping the benefits of what you're putting out there for those of us that are uh, willing to listen and absorb. And um, I just really am I'm grateful for you being here today. And we, um, we of course, will share out with this uh, podcast and with this blog all of the ways that you can connect with Sarah. She's already um, shared her email address as well. Um, is there anything else that you want to say to take us out, Sarah? Just, Karen, I really appreciate you having me here today. I appreciate your work. I appreciate your participation in our ESG for Building working group, which, as you know, we are trying to create a set of defining principles uh, for environmental, social, and governance strategies specifically for the building industry so that it's created by, by the industry for the industry and not you know, just imposed upon us by uh, uh, experts in, from other sectors. Um, so really appreciate your uh, participation in that. You've been... Uh, incredibly instrumental um, in that group. And um, I, I really enjoy the Offsite Dirt uh, vlogs and, and your work as well. So um, awesome. the feeling is mutual and uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on today and thanks to everyone for listening. Yeah. Well, everybody out there, Offsite Dirt land, thank you for tuning in. Always come back. We've got a lot more great content about uh, high performance homes, innovations and in workforce development in products, materials, in people development, uh, in all things about regenerative and amazing real estate development projects. We're your source. Keep coming back. Thank you so much. Have a great day.